Welcome back, clinical problem solvers. Good morning. It's Tuesday. It's Neurology VMR. First in a long time. Good to see everyone. Some friendly neurology friend faces and some new faces, which is wonderful as well. And for the first time, uh, to my knowledge and awareness, everything is all set. No awkward silence of begging someone to talk about neurology. So um, we have a case, we have discussants, we have 38 people participating, which is fantastic. So thanks to Maria and team for um, setting all this up for us today. And why don't we have the case presenter and the discussants introduce themselves and we'll get started and we'll have the whole hour for the first time. We will take every minute, maybe even a few more. I could go first. I'm Kuchal, and nice meeting you, Dr. Aaron. And this is going to be the first time I'm going to be presenting a case to you. And a fun fact about me, my favorite word during winter is apricity, which just means warmth of the sun during winter. Excellent. And where are you joining us from, Kuchal, if you don't know? Uh, Chicago. From Chicago. Fantastic. And welcome. Hello. I'm one of the case discussants. And this is going to be my first time discussing a case with you, Dr. Aaron. And I'm applying for internal medicine match this year, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity. Um, and my name is Tansu. I'm from Turkey. Um, currently, I'm located in New York City. Fantastic. I don't know why everyone is calling me Dr. Aaron. Is this a new formal um, uh, element of NeuroVMR? Maria and others have organized. Uh, Aaron is, is fine. Um, with me. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Welcome, Tansu. Excited to discuss this case. And we have another discussant. Yes. Um, hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hello, Aaron. Um, well, my name is Gerardo Luna. I am from Lima, Peru, and I'm a medical student. And currently, I am um, starting my fifth year here of out of seven years of training here in Peru. And well, I'm very, very excited uh, for this case discussion because I really love neurology and I especially admire a lot of your work that you've done here in CP Solvers and outside. Yeah, so I'm very excited. Fantastic. Welcome, Gerardo. A long lineage of uh, neurophilia in Peru with our friends um, Marco and Valeria and Kiara. Um, so welcome as well. Okay, um, who needs to be made a co-host? I think Maria is all set. We good? Everything that needs to happen is happening. Maria is nodding her head. Okay, fantastic. Then let's hear just the chief concern. Yeah, I forgot to unmute myself, so. so. No problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the chief complaint is the patient was unable to grasp objects unable to grasp objects fantastic so tansu or gerardo where would you start with this um oh, okay go go ahead tansu yeah that's okay you can go first okay th thank you and um, well um if uh, i see a patient that complains uh, that he or she is unable to grasp grasp objects i will first make sure if it is a, a case of weakness like with true muscular weakness or if it is a case of for example apraxia when the person is unable to to coordinate or uh, execute movements in a in the right way so i will first assess like the muscle strength just to Yes, to start with the evaluation of the patient. Yeah, the, that is the first thought that came to mind. And what about you, Tans? Fantastic. Weakness um, and apraxia, which um, would be reason someone couldn't grasp objects. Fantastic. Anything, yeah, anything else to add, Tansu? Yes, I'm thinking along the similar lines. Also, I'm curious if this is one-sided or two-sided. So if the patient um, is experiencing the weakness on one hand or both, because um, then the differential diagnosis would be different and my um, line of thinking would be different depending on um, this fact. Um, and if it's on 
only one hand, then I would think more central causes of um, weakness because peripheral causes tend to affect um, more than one extremity usually. And I'm also very curious about the time course, um, if this is I mean, in neuro neurology, differential diagnosis, um, localization, times time course uh, helps us um, make our differential diagnosis. So um, it would be very, very helpful to know if this is an acute, subacute, or um, chronic process. Fantastic. Um, great points, both Tansu and Gerardo. Let's explore this a little bit more. Um, so um, let's talk more about possibilities for why someone couldn't grasp objects. Weakness, of course, if someone was too weak, um, to grasp the object. Um, apraxia, Gerardo brought up if the patient maybe has their strength and other elements, which we can think about, but is um, unable to perform the skilled action of grasping. Any other reasons we could think of that somebody would have trouble grasping objects? Going from um, the one extremity or both um, hypothesis, if it's on just one hand, I would be thinking of brachial plexus injuries, for example, um, and especially if this is a sudden onset uh, weakness on one, one hand. Um, yeah. 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 So we're starting to get into localization. I'm actually going to ask a few questions. I didn't ask that question well to move even more proximally. So let's just think of modalities which are going to help us in the localization. We talked about the modality of strength or the deficit of weakness, which would put us somewhere along the motor pathways. We talked about apraxia, um, so that would put us in a higher level motor disorder. What else, what other systems, what other types of yeah. object, um, problems could make it hard for someone to grasp objects? Speaking maybe of, ataxia, maybe ataxia, la lack yeah. of coordination. Yeah. yeah, so a lack of coordination, right? And there's probably maybe one, two more I could think of also. Um, also, for example, uh, because we usually, when we think about ataxia, we only think about the structure of the cerebellum, but actually you can have sensory ataxia, which not, not has, it doesn't have to involve the structure itself, but the pathways that go uh, from the periphery to the, uh, to the cerebellar cortex. So I think that is an important thing to, uh, to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Right. So ataxia, so in coordination, um, and then a loss of sensation. You mentioned sensory ataxia in particular, which is which is fantastic. Ataxia, we always think cerebellum, right? But as you point out, the cerebellum is only as good as its inputs and outputs, which we can talk about if this turns out to be relevant in this case. But yeah, if a patient has um, very impaired sensation, particularly the sensation of um, proprioception, right? They won't be able to guide um, movements based on sensory feedback. So that can cause ataxia. Or if the patient simply has numbness, right? They won't be able to sort of feel the object in their hand and um, have the appropriate level of um, uh, force and dexterity to, to grasp it. So I think those are the main ones I would think of. Is it a weak, is it a problem with one of the elemental modalities, weakness, sensation, or coordination, or a higher level, higher level um, problem such as apraxia, which technically means a um, difficulty performing learned um, actions. So sort of difficulty performing um, actions in a skilled way in which you'd be able to hopefully prove on exam that the hand is strong, the sensation is normal in the hand, the coordination is normal, and yet there will be tests if they become relevant, we can discuss that, that the patient can't grasp. So with that sort of general framework in mind that this could be a problem of weakness, sensation, coordination, or higher level motor, um, and um, what types of questions would you ask on the history? Of course, the exam is going to be very helpful, but so that we're tuned in when we hear the history, what types of questions would you ask to try to start teasing this apart? Is this a problem of motor, sensory, coordination, um, or higher order? Um, what types of questions would you ask? I think Gerardo made an excellent point about um, this could be the possibility of um, uh, ataxia, either sensory or cerebellar. And to tease that out, I would test the uh, sensory functions of the hand. So like pinprick, pinprick test, and if the patient is able to experience the temperature sensation in that hand, just to tease those apart. And um, I would also test um, finger to nose test would be helpful if there's an ataxic, um, ataxic finger to nose movement to um, understand if this is an ataxia or weakness. Because in weakness, um, the movement would be perhaps slow, but I wouldn't expect it to be 
ataxic. Fantastic. Uh, We're getting uh, into some aspects of the exam that will help us, which is great. Um, and um, what else would help us on the, the history? What types of questions? Yeah. I know the feeling maybe you have, Tansu, as you hear or you see the patient walk in or you hear the chief concern and you think, I got to check this on exam to sort this out. Um, and in truth, when we watch the patient walk in and as we watch them maybe opening um, or picking up their phone to show us a picture or something, we're already observing their neurologic exam. But usually we'll we'll take a history first, even though we're eager to get out our reflex hammer or do some test for apraxia we just read about. But what questions might we ask on the history also to sort of get a sense of um, which modality is affected here? Um, can I uh, can I go ahead? Um, so I think a question that would be important is, for example, if how is the um, other activities, other daily activities uh, performed? How are these activities performed? For example, uh, taking a bath, um, um, because the person has to close their eyes in order to, I don't know, wash uh, her, her hair or wash other parts of their body. So I, I remember that in a past BMR, you said like uh, the bath, taking a bath is like um your own exam but i i the name of the exam i just i just forget but it's like uh well no well what was the name of that um the romberg test the romberg test yes it is uh, basically a romberg machine machine so i think that would be important and for weakness i um for example i know that rabbi said to to the BMR some important thing uh, about weakness and is that when the person is resting and uh, they don't have they aren't like exercising their muscles so they won't be feeling the loss of strength but it, if it is not uh, if this weakness is not caused by a loss of a strength then it can be for another differential diagnosis and not not true neurologic weakness. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I'm enjoying hearing you quote me, quoting my mentor, um, three uh, generations of people quoting Dr. Marty Samuels, who sadly uh, uh, passed away um, in the past year. Yeah, I used to call the shower the Romberg machine, that when patients close their eyes um, in the shower, they should have given themselves their own Romberg test. I won't go into it now, but he had a whole sort of thing about bathroom neurology, all the bad things that can happen to you um, in the bathroom related to neurology. So yeah, so this is great. So, you know, um, sometimes you can just ask the patient simple questions. They may say, I'm having trouble kind of picking things up. And you might say, well, do you have a sense of why that is? And they might tell you, well, my hand is very numb. Or they might tell you, I feel clumsy. And even those might be tricky. Some people say numb when they mean weak and weak when they mean numb. But I usually let them explain to me what they think the problem is. This is similar to the approach many of you have heard me say about, um, about gait, right? To ask, to, we have all these different modalities that go into gait and ask the patient, do you feel weak in your legs? Do you feel numb um, in your legs? Is there pain there? Do you feel that you're, if I could make you fully strong, it would be normal or is there something else? So those are the questions you might ask here. What do you think the reason is you can't grasp these objects? Then you might ask is, um, Important question Tansu asks, is this one hand um, or is it happening on both hands? Um, and then what exactly is it? Do you feel weak in the hand? Do you feel numb or tingly or pain in the hand? Um, do you feel the hand is clumsy? Um, for apraxia, I'm not sure I could think of a, a clear question, but if the patient told me all those other things were fine, um, then you might start wondering about some higher order um, motor disorder. And then I would probably want to ask also if the patient is telling us one or both um, hands and to say, is there any problem walking or any problem you've noticed with your feet or any problem you've noticed uh, anywhere else so that we're trying to start the process of localization, even the history. As Tansu said, if this is in one hand then we and it's weakness, then we can start from the contralateral motor cortex and go all the way down um, through the subcortical white matter, brainstem across the other side of the spinal cord, uh, nerve roots, uh, nerves, plexuses, neuromuscular junction muscle. And we know we're somewhere along there, um, right? And if the patient tells us it's both hands or it's bilateral, then that's going to limit our possibilities. Um, and of course, we'll want to know 
the time force, as was also said, that this happened suddenly and has it been static? Is it gradually worsening, et cetera? So with those questions in mind in this broad, I won't even call it a differential diagnosis, this broad set of considerations of why a patient couldn't grasp objects, let's um, hear what the patient thinks is the reason they can't grasp objects. Okay, so Bouchal has been waiting patiently for our uh, expansive discussion on the four words she's given us so far. Let's hear the HPI, please. So um, the history of presenting illness uh, is a nine-year-old boy complained that he couldn't grasp the objects with his hands, both. He was apparently normal till two days ago. And two days ago, he found it difficult to hold his pencil during a class test, but stated that he managed to complete the test regardless. One day ago, he was unable to hold his bat and ball and hence had to skip his cricket practice. Since morning, he was dropping everything at home and his parents had to help him with his daily activities, including bathing, and felt that his speech was slurred. No similar episodes in the past, no history of nausea, vomiting, headache, double vision, or weakness in his legs, no history of incontinence or breathing difficulty. The past history, frequent history of sore throat present last episode three months ago. Um, history of tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy done uh, one year ago. Normal birth and developmental history. Social history plays kabaddi and cricket. He's immunized up to date. Family history, grandmother's diabetic. Um, sister has migraine headaches. Okay, I saw a lot of surprised um, eyebrows like mine when we heard this as a, a child. Um, for those of you interested in neurology, at least in the U.S., adult neurology residents actually do a few months of pediatric neurology, and pediatric neurology residents um, uh, do a year of adult neurology. So we have some crossover, but in the end, it's very rare for people to practice both. And places I've worked on in the U.S., since I'm not boarded in pediatrics, people have asked me about pediatric cases. And I always say, well, are they old enough to walk and talk? Then I think we can do the localization um, thing. And if it's a baby, that's a whole other set of differential diagnoses, the, the quote unquote floppy baby for hypotonia or um, babies with various issues. Those I don't, I don't feel comfortable thinking about um, infant cases, but I think um, this uh, young boy can tell us the history and um, participate in the exam. So hopefully we can apply some of the same um, principles and have to think of some pediatric differential diagnoses we wouldn't normally think of. Okay, um, Tansu, Gerardo, um, thoughts on on the history here? I can go first, um, if that's okay. So since this is a nine-year-old boy, um, it's a pediatric case and um, I'm not, I don't feel 100% comfortable, but I will just think of like an adult patient in some aspects and I will try to think other pediatric diseases as we move on. Um, so since the weakness is in both hands and um, the patient has speech slowed, that is kind of bringing me to um, the uh, cerebral cort cortex, especially in a, if this boy is a right-handed um, person, then it would take me to the left hemisphere for um, speech control. But um, since the issue is in both hands, I don't think I can localize it so easily to the left hemisphere because we have um, two hand involvement. And then dropping everything. Um, and it's the boy dropping everything is showing me that um, it's not just small objects. It's not like a an, an ataxia, uh, not being able to use the fine muscles of the hand, but it's more like a gross motor issue. Um, and the preceding sore throat and recurring sore throats um, his, in the past medical history is making me think of um, maybe strep throat. I'm not sure if uh, they checked what kind of uh, recurrent sore throat. Um, the patient head. And if this is strep throat, then um, what this brings to mind is Sydenham chorea. Um, so, but I'm not sure if he has choriform movements, which would be something like dancing, uh, writhing, kind of like hand movements. Um, so I would like to know more about that um, to begin with. 
Yeah, fantastic thoughts. Um, so, well, uh, let's hear from Gerardo and then I'll tell you some of my thoughts. Sorry, great thoughts. I wanted to pick up on some of them, but bring Gerardo into the discussion, then I'll comment. <laughs> And thanks. And well, when I heard the age of the patient, I was I'm very concerned because I haven't taken pediatrics yet. But um, I know that um, in this population, in um, with neurology concerns, um, it can be related to, for example, a malignancy. And we know that malignancies in pediatric patients can be localized usually in the cerebellum or in the uh, post in the posterior fossa. So I thought that, but then as the history continued, I didn't see like signs of that because they, there was no tronchal ataxia and the symptoms have evolved very rapidly. So that made me take that possibility away. But um, some concerns that I have is that, for example, the parents report a slurred speech. I want to know if the slurred speech is just like um, the, the child being clumsy with their words or they are trying to produce sounds that aren't uh, articulated um, accurately. So I would uh, like to explore more about the speech. And well, I something came to mind also that, for example, uh, it, when you have problems in, well, we we not actually at this moment know if this is truly weakness or ataxia or apraxia, but as something that came to mind is, is that for this muscle, uh, uh, for muscle control, you you the the muscle and the nerves are not the only things involved. For example, and uh, the neuromuscular junction can be uh, a problem in this case. For example, I thought about uh, because I was reading also the comments and I thought about my senior and for example in in this case uh, it could be from a thymic hyperplasia or not necessarily a thymoma and but that uh, would lead me to to check the neurological exam because we know that myasthenia presents uh, mainly in the upper extremities and more than the lower extremities so that is uh, that um connects with the with the case but also oculobulbar signs which uh in the history, we don't see much oculobulbar signs because there's no double vision, but there is a, a little bit of difficulty breathing and the slurred speech. So I would really pay attention to that, those uh, cranial nerves and, and see if I can find any, any clue. Yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah, great thoughts um, from both of you. So yeah, just... Um... The first thing it sounds like everyone, uh, you know, put on the brakes in their mind when they heard a a, a nine year old, um, and then started thinking about some pediatric diagnoses, and then bringing back the localization and time course, which um, I think will serve us quite well in this case. So it's still not clear, right, if he's weak or numb or ataxic um, or apractic in his hands. We're going to have to sort that on the exam. But you both picked up very importantly on the slurred speech. Um, so we are no longer just by the nature of being both hands, right? It's probably not the peripheral nervous system and just both hands and not affecting the feet if possible, but it seems a little less likely, doesn't it? To have a diffuse peripheral neuropathy. It's probably not both brachial plexuses at the same time, that would be a little bit unlikely. Usually something affecting the plexus is um, often structural and so often on one side. Um, and usually there are exceptions. Um, to get just the cervical nerve roots on both sides, right? And nothing affecting roots elsewhere would also be a little peculiar. And then we're back to the spinal cord and then we couldn't have slurred speech from there. So we have to get um, up higher, right? And so the slurred speech, um, Gerardo is um, trying to tease apart, is this gonna turn out to be aphasia, a problem with language or dysarthria, a problem with the articulation of speech. And probably if we wanna put slurred speech and bilateral hands, um, together, then we're probably thinking of more dysarthria, right? Because it'd be hard to get a left hemisphere lesion and language uh, areas as um, Tansu proposed, but then left and right hand areas in the motor cortex seems like a, a stretch, although 
we try to explain everything with one lesion. Maybe there are, are multifocal lesions here, but if we were going to do this with one lesion and have both hands unable to um, grasp objects or unable to um, function in a lot of contexts um, and slurred speech together, I would probably um, think of putting that in the cerebellum. Of course, we'll we'll sort this out on the exam, but to think of bilateral incoordination and slurred um, speech, bilateral incoordination of the limbs and slurred speech, wonder if we have problems in the bilateral cerebellar uh, hemispheres. That's where my mind was going, that's still not one lesion, I guess, but one sort of region that could cause all of this. And then when I thought of a nine-year-old with acute and progressive um, cerebellar um, problems, I thought of um, post-infectious cerebellitis. And this is a condition, I've seen a few cases on pediatric rotations or in places where I've been asked to, to see children um, that um, I think the most common is post-viral, post-VZV, um, chicken pox actually, which is less and less with vaccination. Um, and relatively acutely over days, the um, child becomes very ataxic. Um, and this is sort of a cousin of Guillain-Barre, I guess you can think of it that way, that um, just a post-infectious inflammatory cerebellitis. Um, what would not fit in this case is that the patient, at least we don't hear about any walking trouble or problems in the legs, though maybe um, this hasn't gotten there yet and we haven't seen that on exam. The other thing that jumped to mind, um, as you said, Tansu, you hear child neurology and strep throat. You, it's hard not to um, think of our step one, step two, could this be synonyms? Korea, something many of us don't see. I've only seen cases where people have consulted me um, online from um, resource limited settings, doing some consulting work that I do for Doctors Without Borders. I did see one case of a very convincing video for Sydenham's Korea. Um, grasping objects, not able to grasp objects would seem very specific. As you said, it's usually dance um, like movements or irregularly irregular movements. I think of Korea as the the atrial fibrillation of movement disorders. It's irregularly irregular continuous um, movements. Um, yes, the patient probably would have some trouble maybe grasping objects, but I'm not sure that's quite how it'd be described. But of course, in real life, we'd be watching this patient if they walked in with Korea. We'd be, maybe just be asking, hearing the story and then saying any any sore throat um, recently. But the sore throat may be, the, may be on the right track there at Tansu with a post-infectious etiology, but maybe it's a post-infectious cerebellitis, but obviously the exam is going to be very helpful here. And then great point, Gerardo, that you made that in adults, primary brain tumors tend to be supratentorial, and in children, primary brain tumors tend to be infratentorial. By primary brain tumors, meaning tumors arising from tissue types um, of the nervous system as opposed to metastases. Um, so you're thinking of things like medulloblastoma, um, and you made the great point that that's, again, we were just thinking pediatric and neurology and maybe some cerebellum. You thought of medulloblastoma, which is a great thought. And then you appropriately said, gee, that for one day of onset, that would be very acute for a neoplasm and then no headache, nausea, um, vomiting to go along with it. Maybe a little atypical. If this was big enough to start causing um, symptoms and signs in the posterior fossa, we might expect to see some other things going along with it as well. So those are sort of my uh, thinking fast, to quote um, my mentor, Marty Samuels. Again, you hear these things and some patterns initially jump to mind. Many of them um, might be correct, but you also have to um, then think slow, right? This is after the Kahneman book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, which Marty um, loved and loved to talk about, that you hear um, a nine-year-old child with a recent sore throat, your mind's going, sitting in Korea. <laughs> and you say, but it's actually not Korea, it's um, maybe difficulty with coordination and some slurred speech, then you say, oh, I was on the post-infectious thinking fast and I'm gonna call it post-infectious cerebellitis. But really we're gonna to have to see on this exam, is this ataxia or is it weakness or is it sensory loss? What Tansu wanted to know from the beginning, from the chief concern, can we see on the exam what is actually um, the, the, the modality that is impairing, impaired that is not allowing the child to grasp objects. So going into the exam, if my primary hypothesis is cerebellum, what, what would we look for in particular on exam to confirm that hypothesis? Um, I would look for other cerebellar signs. So not just limb ataxia. I mean, I know that um, the vermis controls the trunk and um, the hemispheres control the limbs. So we can see only um, uh, the 
involvement of the hemispheres without the involvement of the vermis um, that could give us only limb ataxia without the truncal ataxia. But I would still be looking for um, truncal ataxia um, since I'm thinking of a post-infectious cerebellitis um, because it makes me think of a more like global involvement of the cerebellum, not just the hemispheres or the vermis. So um, truncal ataxia, gated ataxia, and I would control um, if there's nystagmus in the eyes. Um, I see that there is no double vision, but there can still be nystagmus um, on one side or both. I would check that. And if it's central, it would be in every direction, not just unidirectional. Um, yeah, those are my initial thoughts, basically. Those are phenomenal initial thoughts. Yeah. So we all want to see what's going on with this hand, right? <laughs> These hands. Are they weak? Are they numb? Are they ataxic? Um, and so what would we look for on finger nose? Well, the finger nose test, right, is looking at um, precision of this movement. And in cerebellar ataxia, what we see is what's called an intention tremor, which is a subtype of action tremor. So you can have a rest tremor, a postural tremor, an action tremor. Action tremor just refers to the fact that the tremor comes out with action. So for example, the tremor of essential tremor comes out with action is usually not there with rest, but it's usually the same amplitude frequency throughout the plane of movement. And the movement is not actually inaccurate. And I'm doing this to the camera and in the era of telemedicine, we don't do finger to nose in the patients or video, we say finger to camera. So we can see what's happening right as it gets close to us. So the tremor of essential tremor is an action tremor, but not an intention tremor. The tremor of cerebellar disease is that as the patient gets closer to the target, the oscillation increases. In other words, as the patient needs more and more precision to the movement, the movement breaks down more and more. So if you were to watch it in slow motion from the nose, it looks like it's not too bad in this general trajectory of towards. Then as it gets closer, it gets harder to sort of make the calculation and make it precise. And it's usually perpendicular to the plane of movement. So the movement between the finger and the nose is in this plane and the oscillation is perpendicular to that plane of movement. Um, so that um, is a prominent sign. Sometimes it's really subtle and you have to really compare the two sides and that will be hard in this case if the two sides are symmetric. And it just at the end, it looks like it's just not sort of perfect. Other things you can check called finger chase. You ask the patient to put their finger up to your finger, but not touch it. And then to mirror you and you move quickly and have them catch up you move quickly and have them catch up and what you'll see with cerebellar disease is they overshoot and then kind of tremor back overshoot and kind of tremor back overshoot and some someone showed me i forget who showed me this but i also asked the patient to draw a square with very sharp borders like this one two three four and they'll overshoot the corners like this so those are other tests. If the ataxia is maybe not obvious, but you think maybe there's something you can do finger chase and have them draw a square. Um, you can look for dysdiadogokinesia, the um, difficulty performing rapid alternating uh, movements. And um, what else can you look for in the limbs? So we don't think of the cerebellum um, uh, as being involved in reflexes, but it's an amazing paper if you love neurology, really love neurology, really love reading about neurology by Gordon Holmes called The Cerebellum of Man, which describes a lot of the stuff. It's an extraordinary historical paper on the cerebellum. He also describes a slight decrease in tone in cerebellar disease, some hypotonia. So if you have the patient stand and kind of swing back and forth, like rotate, you'll see when we do this, our arms flop around a little bit, but the arms flop a little bit um, more in these patients. And then there's something called rebound or impaired check, where you have the patient put their arms out like you're going to test pronator drift, and you tell them to keep them there, and you push down and release, and I can keep my arm there, and the patient with cerebellar disease might um, massively overshoot um, or have a called um, impaired check or increased rebound. So those are all things, fun things you can check for um, the limb for signs of cerebellar disease. And then great point, Tansu, we can look for other clues. Most patients with nystagmus don't notice they have diastagmus, they might be dizzy, um, or if there are ocular alignment abnormalities as part of the package that um, comes with the nystagmus for particular lesion sites, then they might um, have other ocular symptoms, but usually the nystagmus itself is, is not um, symptomatic. So sometimes patients say their eyes feel like they're, they're moving, but so we would wanna look for nystagmus. And as you um, brilliantly pointed out, when it's a central cause, meaning in the central parts of the vestibular pathways, brainstem or cerebellum, the um, 
the nystagmus is direction changing, meaning it, the fast phase is in the direction of gaze in all positions. Um, so mm -hmm. right beating on right gaze, left beating on left gaze, et cetera. And we definitely want to look at this patient's gait. You made another um, very important um, point that if this is post-infectious cerebellitis, um, usually this is a pan-cerebellar syndrome. We already have both cerebellar hemispheres. Wouldn't we have the vermis too? I don't see enough of this condition since I usually for some reason doesn't occur in adults. It's a pediatric condition um, to know whether you could get sort of just the hemispheres or maybe we're seeing the child so early that the um, truncal ataxia um, and gait ataxia is not yet present, but um, maybe it's there and just has not been prominently um, noted in the history. So, or we could be wrong, and this patient is weak and has sensory problems and has areflexia and bilateral facial weakness, and we are missing the glaring post-infectious possibility of Guillain-Barre syndrome, and this patient um, has bifacial weakness, um, some difficult sensory ataxia and or weakness and or numbness in the hands, and areflexia, and um, we go down that pathway. So we're interested in all these things. So what, what did you find on the exam, Kuchal? Yeah, so the discussion so far is amazing. I wish I could make it very hard for you, but the physical exam, the heart rate is 100, BP is 100 by 70, respiratory rate is 16, um, SpO2 was 98 in Brumar, HE, ENT was normal, in CVS there was a murmur, and RS, it was clear, abdomen was soft, CNS, he was conscious oriented to time, place, person, involuntary movements of both hands present. And motor, right upper limb strength was four by five, left upper limb four by five, bilateral lower limb was also four by five. Milk made sign was positive and pronator sign was positive. Tone decreased in both upper and, in, and lower limb. Reflexes were normal except for pendular knee jerk. Sensations were intact. Um, cranial nerve, apart from occasional dysarthria, all the other cranial nerves were intact. No fast pointing, knee to heel test was normal, no dysdiadokinesia. The next day, he began to have an unstable gait as well as emotional lability. There was just a burst of crying and then during the exam, he was suddenly, um, yeah, so he had emotional lovability. On the extremities, there were rashes present on his knees. Okay, so we had fun talking about the cerebellum, but um, uh, it turns out to be a bit of a, a tangent, doesn't it, with that normal cerebellar testing. So you've given us involuntary movements. Can you tell us a little bit more um, when someone Tell, when we have maybe an e-consult, right, over um, email or from a provider trying to describe a movement disorder, I say, well, they say picture is worth a thousand words, but a video is worth a million words if yeah. we're trying to figure out a movement disorder. Um, are you able to tell us a little bit more about what those involuntary movements um, were? Yeah, I was actually trying to search for my video. I couldn't really find it. I apologize for that. Um, so when you're speaking with him, suddenly he starts mowing and then he's normal again. And um, so it keeps happening throughout. And then there's bursts of finding difficulty to speak. And he, he was, uh, again, he's just normal. So it's just episodic. It's not like continuous. It's not sustained. Uh -huh. And what are the actual without you saying the name of the movement disorder, can you tell us what the limbs were observed to be doing? The hands um, or show us? So it, was, it was more like, uh, if you've seen Michael Jackson moon dance, it's a more like that, um, but it's just, but then without any of his uh, moon, it's not the walk, but just the upper limb part of it. Okay, very good. Thank you for describing it for us. And Maria is diligently documenting that Michael Jackson's moonwalk in the physical exam for historical <laughs> record purposes, which is phenomenal. Um, okay. Um, Gerardo, I think Tansu, you gave us amazing points last going into the exam. Gerardo, you wanna tell us your interpretation of the exam? Yeah, so, well, I'm a little bit uh, confused, but I, I will try to do my best with the interpretation of these findings. So as I said, the cranial nerve examination, I thought was very important, but 
since we only see dysarthria, we can like, I think we can exclude uh, the more cortical causes, for example, apraxia that we were taking into consideration. And well, I, I was also thinking, what if this could be a uh, Guillain Barre? Because there was, um, at first when the uh, when they were telling me us about the vitals, we I saw like some mild hypotension and say like an increased heart rate for the age. So I was thinking about this autonomia, which can happen in um, in Guillain Barre because it it can involve the peripheral nerves and the nerves that are in charge of regulating uh, the vitals. So, but as the the neuro exam continued, like the involuntary movements of both hands and like the symmetric, they are symmetrical, and also the strength in the in the upper and lower leg were basically uh, not not really compromised. So I don't think it is a case of weakness itself, but another neurological cause um so and also if uh, for the cerebellar signs that made me also confused because i know that um as you said cerebellum is not only in charge of coordination but it is also in charge of tone and it is also also in charge of regulating emotions as i remember uh, a teacher told me and that emotional liability, I thought maybe it could be explained for uh, in for uh, the post-infectious cerebellitis. But since other signs of cerebellar involvement are not present, I don't think so. Um, so and also the cardiac murmur, I would like to know if it is a physiologic murmur because children tend to have those physiologic murmurs, like the still. A still murmur. So I would like to have a better description of how the murmur was, just for clarity purposes. And then, yeah, those are my thoughts. Fantastic. Yeah, lots of great um, pearls in there. Yeah, you might have said, oh, there's some emotional piece here. Well, the cerebellum just does coordination. Um, actually, not the case. One of um, the great teachers I got to learn from at Mass General Hospital, Jeremy Schmaman, described the role of the cerebellum in emotion and described the cerebellar cognitive affective disorder now called Schmaman um, syndrome and that the cerebellum is involved in regulating emotions and um, I don't know if you can find his talks online but he gives a beautiful talk on the discovery of this and the anatomy and the physiology and other sort of an emotional dysregulation an emotional ataxia an emotional dysmetria not always but um, so as you said um, there's an interesting case where we this happens, you go into the exam with a strong hypothesis of the cerebellum and you do the exam and say, um, I have to reframe and it can be hard to pull yourself away from where you um, anchored, but really nothing here um, going for the cerebellum. As you said, there's no limb ataxia. There are abnormal involuntary movements, which you wouldn't expect unless as the patient moved, it were getting some sort of ataxic um, uh, uh, tremor. Um, there's no nystagmus, though you can you don't always have nystagmus with cerebellar lesions. That's more when the flocculonodular midline part of the cerebellum is affected. Um, so um, as you said, a lot of things here, we went in with a hypothesis and we left um, with things that have not really gone along with it. Um, so um, what do you think is going on here, Tansu? And then I'll opine as well. I thought um, we saw a couple upper motor neuron signs here, um, like pronator drift, for example. So I was thinking I everything in the exam that we saw was distancing me from the cerebellum as well. But the pronator drift made me think of maybe like an upper motor, motor neuron sign and um, the uh, hemisphere, cerebellar hemispheres, an unstable emotional liability uh, was making me think of, again, um, is there something wrong in the frontal cortex or is this a pseudobulbar affect type of um, picture? And rashes on the extremities were really, really interesting. And I didn't know what to make of it, honestly, um, how to connect it with rest of the exam. 
Um, and cardiac murmur just made me think of, again, um, going back to the patient's past medical history of sore throats. Um, could this be a um, like something in the mitral valve um, after the strep throat infection or the recurrent um, after the recurrent sore throats? So I was just um, trying to connect everything together, um, but I, I don't know what to make of the rash. And, that's what I'm thinking at this point. Yeah, great thoughts. Well, this is one where um, thinking fast took us to the right place, and then we found all the reasons to think of other things slowly. But yeah, thinking fast had it correct. Hansu, once you saw sore throat and child, you said synonyms Korea. And I think, um, what did Maria write here? Michael Jackson's moonwalkish, um, plus tonsils, plus age, um, plus acute. Um, does sound like synonyms Korea. So what fits for that and what doesn't? Well, there are involuntary movements that are happening throughout and that have a sort of dance-like um, character. That fits. The milkmaid grip, so when you have the um, patient squeeze your hand like a handshake or squeeze your finger, it kind of fluctuates. That's a phenomenon called motor impersistence. That's part of Korea. We ask a patient with Korea to stick their tongue out, the tongue sort of darts um, in and out. It's called motor and persistence as part of kind of the package of Korea. Um, however, I agree with you, um, Tansu, shouldn't be weak, shouldn't have a pronator drift, shouldn't have four out of five weakness. Although if a patient's having kind of continuous Korea form movements when the arms are held out in pronator drift position, maybe it's a little confusing. And then the unstable gait can also be Korea, um, the one very striking video that was sent to me in the case I'm thinking of in a teleconsult, um, yeah, the patient had a, um, as they were walking also, very Korea form movements that were disrupting the gait. Um, and then we have the sore throat, we have the rheumatic um, heart disease piece, we have the rash, um, which I think all goes along with um, uh, post-streptococcal systemic plus post-streptococcal um, neurology. So um, how do you make this diagnosis? Um, I think you can look for ASO titers. I'm not sure necessarily um, need to in this case with everything fitting together. You treat the strep throat. I feel like I looked this up for that case and maybe Uchal can teach us, but I think some people use steroids and some people um, don't given that it's considered a post-infectious inflammatory um, phenomenon. And I think that then um, children are given some type of suppressive um, therapy, um, antibiotic therapy, but I'm really reaching, uh, again, I don't see this. So it, back to the one time I um, looked this up to try to help um, some colleagues who were, who were seeing this um, abroad. So um, yeah, just coming back to first principles, I think um, to see if there's anything that would stray us away, we have the, um, we have this time course that's sort of acute but not sudden. So we were thinking infectious inflammatory. We have a previous infection. So we're still in the infectious inflammatory um, category. And then we have new neurology that appears to be um, a movement disorder. The only thing we really can't explain here is the weakness, although that may be a factor of difficult to examine a patient who doesn't have full control over their movements. And then um, it was interesting here that the localization piece maybe didn't um, I wouldn't say it didn't help us as much. It helped us to have a nice conversation about the cerebellum, um, which ended up not being relevant. But for the cases where we've discussed together movement disorders, you may have heard me say, this is the one place where we don't think as much about localization. We don't think as much, say, Korea localizes here and dystonia here, but the phenomenology gives us a differential diagnosis. So you have to decide, is this looking at the movement? Is this a tremor? Is this Korea? Is this dystonia? Is this myoclonus? Is this tick? And then each of those have their own differential diagnosis. And I divide those into a few categories, either primary neurologic disease, structural lesion, systemic cause, or some type of medication drug. And they're sort of overlapping, but distinct ones. So if we took Korea, we said, well, this is Korea. What primary neurologic diseases, things like Huntington's Korea, there are other genetic conditions that can have Korea. Structural lesion for Korea, well, you can get hemichorea, hemibolismus from lesions of the subthalamic nucleus, common on step one, not that common in real life. I've seen it maybe um, one time or uh, structural lesion, toxoplasmosis likes the basal ganglia. It's reported you can get hemichorea, hemibolismus um, with that. Um, systemic diseases, well, we've seen one 
here causing chorea, um, post-infectious um, synonyms chorea. You can get um, chorea with uh, polycythemia vera. I don't know why that is, but it's described, not a disease, but a um, condition, pregnancy. You can get hyperemesis, uh, hy not uh, hyperemesis gravidarum, I'm sorry, chorea gravidarum, um, chorea um, during the period of pregnancy. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can be associated with chorea. And then um, medications, drugs associated with chorea, I think, uh, I know cocaine can, can do it. Other medications that can cause chorea as a side effect, I'm not sure. But um, you can, um, once you know the movement disorder, then they have a differential and it's often so long that I divide it into these um, uh, primary neurologic disease, structural, um, neuro structural brain lesion um, or structural nervous system lesion, uh, systemic condition or um, toxic um, medication drug. And I think Reza and I made a couple of schemas, maybe even one for Korea that sort of divided into this framework. Reza being Reza was able to find some mnemonic for the four categories, mist or n mist or something, misto, misty, um, mystify, I forget what it was, uh, and has sort of a comprehensive um, list of these. I think we made ones for the major movement disorders, I think Korea too, but maybe someone can, can find it and put it in the chat if that's the case. Okay. So Kuchal was Tansu right from the first aliquot that this was Sydenham's chorea? And if so, how do you make that diagnosis and um, treat it? Because many of us probably have not seen and may not um, see that condition in our practice. Okay, so I am not going to tell you the diagnosis now or say if it's right or wrong. But um, the, just clarify, the rashes were mosquito bites. We were also excited that it could be something of a um, a part of a cyst syndrome or something, but it turned out to just be mosquito, the boring mosquito bites. But um, the next aliquot, the labs came out. The CBC uh, hemoglobin was 10, WBC 18,000, platelet was 1 lakh 50,000, differentials, um, neutrophil was 78, lymph was 18, monocyte 2, eosinophil is 1, ESR was 75. CRP was 35, chest was clear, um, ECG was normal, the echo showed a mild mitral stenosis and no pulmonary hypertension, CT of the head was normal, and MRI of the brain showed hyperintense lesion present in the basal ganglia, um, TSH was normal, ANA was negative. And the next aliquot is the final one where I will just reveal the diagnosis too. Okay. Um, Tansu or Gerardo, we went into this diagnostic testing as we should with a hypothesis. Anything here confirm or refute that hypothesis of Sydenham's Korea? Mitral stenosis on the echocardiography, it just shows me that normally I would expect a mitral regurgitation in the acute phase, but it just shows me that this has been an ongoing process so that um, there's a stenosis of the valve. And it just confirms um, the information that I got from the past medical history that since this uh, patient had recurrent sore throats, that probably contributed um, to the mitral valve's stenosis at this point going from regurgitation to stenosis. Yeah, great point. I don't know what it is about, I mean, we probably all had strep throat many times. It's pretty uncommon to get Sydenham's chorea, though, well, our time is limited. Some of you have heard me tell the story before as a medical student that I actually did have post-infectious chorea as an adult, a very mild um, case, which was an interesting experience. I can tell you about another time, but um, why some people get Sydenham's chorea or rheumatic heart disease from um, strep and some don't. And the reason I'm mentioning that is presumably there's some immune predisposition in such um, patients that, you know, host plus um, um, uh, microbe leads to this. And so, yeah, the mitral stenosis suggests that maybe um, one or more times before the patient has had an immune mediated reaction to strep that has focused on the heart. And this time it happens to be um, the brain. That's an interesting, um, interesting hypothesis. Yeah. Um, Gerardo, anything here? Pull you some in a different direction or help you feel more comfortable with the diagnosis of sydenhams yeah well for the for these results in the exam i think that it is more 
clear and consistent that this could be uh, a post-strep phenomenon. So I, if I ha find hyperintense lesions in the basal ganglia, I know that um, if it is not an occupying lesion and it is like uh, basically an inflammation of these structures, I know that it is compatible with Seidenhaupt's chorea. So that would make me think about that. And also, well, uh, I, I was also thinking about mitral stenosis because I know that in the acute phase, as Tansu said, it is mitral regurgitation, but it can be a sign that it is, we are not in the acute phase, but, but in the chronic phase, it just had a sudden onset of symptoms. So, uh, well, there is an increased, uh, the increased inflammatory markers. So I think there is a possibility that there is an a inflammatory process going on. Um, and yeah, I think that the my main um, uh, differential diagnosis would be um, like rheumatic fever. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I actually don't know about the MRI brain because many parts of the world where Sydenham's Korea is still seen, um, MRI is not necessarily available slash accessible slash affordable. Um, and so, and it's a clinical diagnosis and the treatment is based on that clinical diagnosis. So I've never looked into what the MRI findings would be, um, but it makes sense that um, the basal ganglia are affected. It's a movement disorder and may have um, hyperintensity that hopefully would resolve with treatment. Um, so I think, yeah, to prove the diagnosis, you need these ASO um, titers. And then I think, like I said, I, I remember looking into this and that there's some controversy over whether steroids should be given or not, but antibiotic suppressive therapy for the future. This is my very um, basic recollection, which may be um, entirely incorrect. So Kuchal, um, tell us what the final diagnosis was, how you made it, and maybe can teach us a little bit about this condition that may be relatively uncommon um, for us to see. And can I ask something before oh, we go on to the uh, final diagnosis? So. Uh, the MRI showing um, the hyperintense lesions in the basal ganglia as a runner-up, maybe differential diagnosis in my mind, I was thinking of Wilson disease. Would we get like um, a ophthalmologic exam for Kaiser Fleischer rings um, or um, serum seroloplasmin urine copper in this case, just to check if that could be a possibility? Great question. Yeah, so young person, new movement disorder of any type, tremor, dystonia, Parkinsonism, chorea, um, you would have to think about Wilson's disease. I think the acuity here would lead me away from a sort of degenerative disorder. Actually, this is one of the diseases some of you have heard me say on my neurology bucket list, like Wilson's, Whipple's, these things we hear about, but actually in real life, very uncommon um, to see. And even I've had some very young patients present with Parkinson's disease, still adults. I think I had someone in their late 20s or early 30s, and I was talking to movement person saying, you know, any other workup you would do? And they said, well, you always got to think about Wilson's. The person really looked like they just had Parkinson's disease. And I think one of the copper studies was mildly abnormal and we thought it was going to turn out to go in that direction. And it just ended up being a very early onset case of a very common disease, Parkinson's disease. So I haven't seen too much Wilson's, but I think this acuity would be um, atypical. Um, and I was going to say, I'm not sure how young it presents because I think there has to be some amount of accumulation of copper due to the genetic defect in copper metabolism, but I actually don't know. And the Kaiser Fleischer ring, I think also is sort of um, takes a while to, to um, develop. I don't know if you would see it in a child unless they're very severely affected, but just, just guessing here. But I think it's the acuity and the sort of generally inflamed state here that would um, move me away from that. Forget what you can see on MRI and in Wilson, is it like face of the giant panda? Or there's all these basal <laughs> things that are like bright dark. There's eye of the tiger and pantothenate kinase deficiency. There's face of the giant panda or something. I think it, I don't know if that's in Wilson's disease. Anyway, great thought, young child with movement disorder. Just some of these cases we talk about, right? We say, I don't know how to make sense with this. Sometimes they say, let's just really simplify it into a step one question, make sure we don't miss anything obvious. Strep throat and neurology, anyone? Synonyms, right? Child with new movement disorder. Anyone? Wilson's to make sure um, that's a great point. We're not um, missing something, getting lost in a, in a sea of 
sort of um, findings that can go in one direction or another and making something complicated where there's a simple story to tell. That's a great point. And that, um, great point that it should be considered. I think the acuity rapid progression um, would, would, would sway me a little bit away from that, but great thought to have it on our radar because things we never see are often not on our um, radar, even if they're on our, our bucket list to have seen one to make sure we don't miss the next one. Okay, Kushal, what did you send and how did you treat this patient? And maybe you can teach us a little bit about Sydenham's Korea unless we um, have this have had this wrong since the beginning. Sure. Um, so I think, no, you've been spot on from the beginning. I've just been trying to hide, but not really. So um, the thing is, we were also thinking about Wilson's disease, but then the patient really didn't really have insurance. And we just had a choice of, you know, where do you allocate your resource? So just based, based on that, we didn't really send for that. And then because ESR, we were going by the Jones criteria, and he did have a murmur, and he did have a movement disorder. And uh, ESR and CRP were also high. So you, Jones criteria, you just have to have either two major criteria, or one major and two minor, and then a couple of other tests which needs to be positive, which is to show the strep infection itself. So ASO titers, we did send it for, and that they were high. Anti-DNAs B was also positive, and throat, uh, throat swab for group A beta hemolytic strep was also positive. So, um, so we did uh, diagnose that to be a Sydenham's chorea and, um, and diagnosed him to have a rheumatic fever. And the chorea itself starts about eight to 12 weeks after the strep infection. So our uh, reasoning was that probably if he had come earlier when he had throat infection, we could have probably got a mitral regurgitant murmur. But now since it's been like eight weeks away or nine, almost close to nine weeks away, we are actually um, getting a stenotic murmur, not a regurgitant one. And um, the other thing was that uh, it was very interesting um, few points. It's like progressive condition. So if we had not treated him then, but just, just waited to see what's really happening, he could have started having the head bobbing and then the tongue can come out and go in. So all that could have happened if we didn't really start treating him. And like you mentioned, uh, Aaron, uh, also prednisolone is indicated and then many uh, I do know many practitioners provide that, but for some reason, my consultant uh, went with a phenobarb TDS and uh, benzathan penicillin 1.2 million units once in 21 days and aspirin 250 milligrams QID. So I think the treatment wise, like there are uh, multiple uh, treatment options which are available and each person just chooses what's best in that practice. And uh, most of the time, the chorea itself is... Um, uh, they recover from it and it's short lived and it's just about six to 10 weeks and they're going to be fine um, mostly. And sometimes it's usually common in women, one thing, and this, he was a guy. So the, and he was nine to 12. So we were also thinking that usually people who are walking to school through farmlands, they could be exposed to um, organophosphate poisoning. And uh, apparently they have just been multiple, and that was a time when pesticides are actually um, in, you know, the uh, pesticides are put in the farm fields before the harvest time in, in my, the setup where I was seeing patients. So that was a very high end diagnosis, whether it's just an extra pyramidal symptom of um, organophosphorus poisoning, or it could be a Wilson, or it could be Tourette's syndrome, for instance. And uh, Tourette's also a psychiatric disorder where they could be presenting with that. So these are all the things we were trying to consider and think about. And, um, but every other examination finding, and it's just as basic labs were like driving us towards the Jones criteria. Um, so we just went with that. And, and the other thing is like, when I was seeing this patient, there was a next bed, the patient was actually with uh, acute glomerular nephritis with impetigo. So the so I was like getting to study about the group A beta hemolytic streptococci and how it's got the molecule mimicry happening in different organs of our body very well. And I found it very fascinating and I thought I would share that with you. So it just depends on um, which part of the body the strep infection comes in. It's the throat, it can affect the heart. 
more common or if also sometimes they've seen impetigo affecting, but that's much rarer. The kidney gets affected more if the source of the infection is on the skin. And I found it very fascinating. And then how the molecular mimicry is actually happening in the body. And uh, the other thing was like, I was reading about it. Apparently after COVID, uh, they have diagnosed a couple of cases of synonym chorea and adults, and that, which is very rare. And um, I found that very interesting. And the other piece of information which I thought I would share is, um, oh, oh yeah, there's a, a drug induced like haloperidol could also cause a chorea, which is like saying. Fantastic. Well, thank you for bringing this case, Guchal. Brilliant discussion, Tansu and Gerardo. Thanks, Maria and team, for setting us up for success today. We're going to try to get back in the groove of NeuroVMR about once a month. And so we'll look forward to discussing more cases with all of you. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you soon.